Good evening, this is Woodblock Printmaker David Ball speaking to you from our Asakusa shop here in Tokyo. Tonight's video isn't going to be one of those that show one of our prints being made start to finish like we've been uploading recently. It's just going to be me here in the shop talking to you. This place has been open about two and a half years now and during that time through talking with visitors we have learned quite a bit about what they find interesting. So I'm going to try a little experiment here this evening. I'm going to kind of pretend that you are one such visitor in our shop and we'll try and talk to you about some of the things that I do with the regular shop visitors. I don't have a cameraman to help me do this and move around so it might be a bit more static than I would like but anyway let's see if we can make this work. Pretty much everybody who comes up these stairs behind me does so with one of two things in mind. They are either looking for one of our Ukiyo-e Heroes prints, the ones we make together with Jed Henry, or they have seen somewhere on the net this print somewhere and would like to know if we have it. <laughs> we can of course accommodate both of those requests and we usually take it from there. When the conversation turns to Hokusai, we can really have some fun with it. Everybody pretty much knows the basics, that he was the designer of the Great Wave print and that his work had a great impact on European artists when it began to appear over there, but we have learned that many people are a tad confused on one particular point. They frequently refer to him as a printmaker, and they are quite surprised to learn that throughout the entire course of his adult life he had nothing to do with the physical aspects of making these things. He never touched the carving tools, the wood blocks, or any of the sheets of paper. He designed, sketched for the most part, and those sketches and sometimes complete designs were then turned over to professional workshops, carvers and printers for the actual production. Now this is not to denigrate him in any way, of course. Although I myself am living on the craftsman side of that equation, I wouldn't try to call Hokusai just a designer. There have been very few men ever on this planet who were as intensely creative as he was. Look at this little print, just for one example. At first glance, it's kind of a standard landscape design, the kind of work that could have been done by many men of his era. But look at this. The mountain represented is, of course, Mount Fuji. That shape is recognizable by all of us. Now, in his era, that was very much a sacred object. The peak was the abode of the gods. But what has Hokusai done? He doesn't care about such things as mere gods, he just slices off the top because this composition needed that. Now you've got to remember back in his day aspiring artists were taken as apprentices in the workroom of experienced men and they learned how to draw everything right from the beginning. How to draw a leaf, one stroke, another stroke, how to draw a fold of fabric, how to draw this, how to draw that and of course how to draw mountains. Hokusai started out that way, of course, in the workroom of one of the major designers of the day, but he was clearly the kind of talent that just couldn't be bounded by those traditions. There's the normal way of depicting Mount Fuji, the classical cone with slopes, the way that everybody else in this country had already drawn it. And then there's Hokusai. Doesn't fit? Cut it off. That kind of thought was literally heretical in his day, but to him, it was all in the day's work. Over in our Hunger Club collection, we've got another very, very interesting Hokusai design. Let's go take a look at it. Look at this little one. This is one of the most incredible pieces of art ever designed, I think, and let me try and explain why. You can, of course, see the main object in the background, the same Mount Fuji, but this object in the foreground might need some explanation. It's what is known as a shachi, sometimes shachi hoko, one of two that was mounted at the very peak of the highest roof of Edo Castle. They're kind of a blend of tiger and fish, and they were there as guardians from, I believe, such things as flood or fire. When seen from the ground, a pair of shachihoko looks something like this. This is a photograph of Nagoya Castle. I, I wasn't able to find one of Edo Castle. <laughs> now, in this print, the ornament's not seen from the ground, but from very close up. Now, did Hokusai have access to a scaffold while work was being done on the thing, or was this just his imagination that let him fly up there to make this sketch? We'll never know, but that's not the main point to me. What's of more interest is something else. The way that the two objects, the extremely distant mountain and the very front present Shachihoko are arranged. If there are any photographers among the viewers of this video, you will know how we could arrange such a juxtaposition. You stand well back from the castle. Get yourself a very long lens. 
you would then be able to put the ornament into full frame. And because of the way that telephoto lenses work, the far distant mountain could also be brought into the frame just like this. It's actually quite easy. Easy in our modern era with such a lens. But this print was designed in 1834. Telephoto lenses? Cameras hadn't even been thought of back then. How on earth did Hoxai come up with this sort of juxtaposition? The extremely distant object brought right into the frame together with something very close up. Something that had never been seen by any man on this planet at that time. Now I'm not being trivially about this. This is the thing that's simply not possible for a raw, you know, native human being to see without technology. And yet it is a real thing. This viewpoint does exist. It's just that it needs those tools to come into being. So how on earth did he do this in 1834? Alien visitation or just simply stupendous creativity at a genius level? My vote is on the latter. Let's close this short little video presentation with a view of some of his other work that we have here in the shop, accompanied by me reading a very interesting quote that he left behind. I drew some pictures I thought fairly good when I was 50, but really nothing I did before the age of 70 was of any value at all. At 73 I have at last caught every aspect of nature, birds, fish, animals, insects, trees, grasses, all. When I am 80 I shall have developed still further, and I will really master the secrets of art at 90. When I reach a hundred, my work will be truly sublime, and my final goal will be attained around the age of 110, when every line and dot I draw will be imbued with life.